Welcome back to Boat Break. Today we are going on the trip of a lifetime. We are going to travel the whole way around the world just using books. And as well as travelling the globe, we're also going to be travelling through time, through genres, it's all very exciting. So as the Book Break headquarters is in London, that's where we're setting off from on our journey. And for our first stop, we are popping on over to Ireland. So like I said, as well as jumping around the map, we're also going to be jumping through time. And with our first book, The Wonder by Emma Donoghue, we will be travelling all the way back to 1859, when a nurse is summoned to look after an 11-year-old girl who claims to have survived without food for months. People are starting to see her as some kind of religious miracle. But the nurse knows that, medically speaking, this obviously can't be true. She's worried that there is maybe some trick being played, or at worst, the girl might be being abused. And this story is actually inspired by a few real life stories of young girls who claim to be surviving without food, so it is absolutely fascinating. Next stop, we're travelling to Iceland, and here let's try a horror story. I Remember You by Irsa Sigurdardottir. In this book, a group of friends decide to buy and renovate this dilapidated seaside house. But when they get there, they discover they are not alone, there is some other presence in the house. Meanwhile, in a nearby town, we meet a young psychiatrist whose son went missing three years earlier. And when he is called to investigate the suicide of an elderly woman who he and his family had never met, he discovers that she was completely obsessed with his missing son. And somehow all of these storylines are going to come together, and when they do, it's going to be terrifying. Next to Canada, all the way on the northernmost tip of Vancouver Island, we find a beautiful, striking glass hotel surrounded by water. So of course this book is The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. So one night in this amazing hotel, a beautiful bartender called Vincent meets a rich businessman, and that is the start of their life together. So Vincent gets sucked into this world of money and glamour, which will all dramatically come to an end with the collapse of this international Ponzi scheme that the businessman was involved in. But all the way back on that first night when they met, Another guest at the hotel found a threatening message written on the glass of the window that said, why don't you swallow broken glass? And he's really shaken by it. We also know that 13 years after this night, Vincent will go mysteriously missing from the deck of a ship. And this book covers everything that happens in between, jumping through time and place, even hinting at alternate possible realities for the characters. It's an absolutely beautiful and mesmerising book that I just loved. I've got a few stops planned for us within the US, so let's start with Hawaii, where we're going to pick up Shark Dialogues by Kiana Davenport. And this is about a Polynesian Hawaiian family through the generations. And the book is partly contemporary, partly historical fiction, partly magical realism. So in the contemporary section, we meet four cousins from this family who have all scattered to live in different places, around the globe, in China, Japan, the Philippines, but they all come back together to visit their grandmother and hear her story of her life. So it's the grandmother's story that takes us on this journey through Hawaiian history and even with elements of Hawaiian mythology weaved in as well. For our next American stop, we are heading to Arizona for a political thriller, Girl in the Rearview Mirror by Kelsey Ray Dimberg. So in this book, a woman called Finn moves to Arizona and becomes the nanny for this really high profile political family. So the grandfather of the family is a senator. But in the summer leading up to the senator's re-election, a woman starts following Finn, claiming that she has secrets about the family that could destroy them. And as Finn tries to protect this family that she's working for, she ends up getting sucked further and further into this scandal and risks exposing some of her own secrets from her own past. And now let's travel all the way across the country to New England, i.e. Lovecraft Country, for the book Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. This book is about various members of a family travelling through this part of the country that was the setting for a lot of H.P. Lovecraft's horror fiction. But just as in real life H.P. Lovecraft expressed some pretty hateful racist views, the family find in the book that as well as the supernatural beings they come across, much scarier in fact is the real life racism that they face along the way. And the TV show is coming out this year, produced by Jordan Peele and J.J. Abrams, so that's really exciting. The book is this wonderful homage to the genre that Lovecraft is so famous for writing in, but with a complete subversion of the racist tropes that often accompany that genre. Next, down to Mexico, where we're going to read The Dead Girls by Jorge Ibaguengoitia. 
This book is a satire based on a very dark true story from the 60s about these brothel-owning, serial-killing sisters who killed at least 90 people, mostly women but some male customers as well. And the book is written as if it's a police report, so it's exposing this really broken justice system and infusing this story that was actually obviously a really terrible story with a lot of dark humour. So the book is actually this great study of human motivation and behaviour. In Cuba we're going to read Revolution Sunday, which was the author Wendy Guerra's first book to be translated into English. This is about a woman called Cleo from a once prominent Cuban family who travels to Spain to collect a prestigious literary award, but when she gets there she is greeted with suspicion. She's treated as an informant for the Castro regime and this suspicion actually follows her back home to Cuba. She finds herself under constant government surveillance. And then she meets and falls in love with a Hollywood filmmaker and discovers that her family are not who she thought. Next to Brazil for My German Brother by Chico Buarque. So this is about a teenage car thief in Brazil called Chicho who discovers a letter hidden amongst his father's belongings which reveals a secret. His father once had a child with another woman, a German woman. So Chicho sets out on this mission to find out what happened to his German half-brother. Did he survive the bombings in the war? Did he actually join the Hitler Youth? It becomes this lifelong obsession to discover what happened to his possibly not even real German brother and this mission is inextricably tied up for Chicho with his own mission to win his father's respect. And this story is actually based on Chico Buarque's own life. The author really did discover that he had a German secret half-brother. Our next book is going to take us to Chile and that is Ways of Going Home by Alejandro Zambra. This is a very experimental book. So it starts with us witnessing an earthquake through the eyes of a nine-year-old boy. And the nine-year-old boy then meets an older girl from his neighbourhood who asks him to spy on her uncle. But then we step back from that storyline and that whole first section becomes a novel within our novel and our new protagonist is the author of that novel. So it's pretty meta and really blurs those lines between fiction and reality. And the novel in both sections is really about trying to make sense of an adult world. So whether that's from the perspective of a child trying to make sense of it or from the perspective of even as an adult looking at your own parents and trying to make sense of their possibly very differing political opinions. Okay, next up we've got a pretty big journey. We're going to New Zealand where we're going to read Waiariki by Patricia Grace. So this is a short story collection that was first published in 1975 and it's snapshots of Maori life written by a Maori author. And a lot of these stories seem really ahead of their time. So for example, the first story is about a young Maori woman called Rose who challenges one of her neighbours who makes a comment referring to a group of Maori people and Rose challenges her on why she doesn't know their names. Even though she knows Rose's name and is so friendly to her, does she just like being able to tell people that she has a Maori friend but doesn't actually apply that empathy to other Maori people? So these are really stories that challenge you. Next up we're going to Australia where we're going to read Amnesty by Aravind Adiga. So this is about a young man called Danny who is living as an undocumented immigrant in Australia after he was denied refugee status when he fled from Sri Lanka. So he is now working as a cleaner when he witnesses some key evidence in a murder. So he faces this really difficult decision. Should he risk coming forward with what he knows, which would help the case, but then he risks exposing himself to the police and having his undocumented status revealed and he might end up being deported? Or should he keep quiet, but then have to wrestle with the morality of that decision? So the book follows him over the course of one day as he decides what he's going to do. Next, a great book to take us to Japan is Breasts and Eggs by Miyoko Kawakami. So in this book we have our narrator, who is a 30-year-old woman struggling with her identity as neither a mother or a daughter. We have her older sister Mikiko, who is really struggling with the way her body has changed as she aged and particularly after giving birth and so has decided to have breast enhancement surgery. And we have Mikiko's teenage daughter, who is so paralysed with the ways that her own body has been changing through puberty that she has just shut down and stopped speaking entirely. And so the book weaves together these three very different Japanese women's lives. For a South Korean book, let's look at The Vegetarian by Han Kang. So this is about a woman who has 
this terrible, gory nightmare and decides afterwards to stop eating meat entirely, which is very unusual in Korea and is seen as this really extreme act. And so the book follows the effect of this decision on the people in our main character's life. She has some pretty unpleasant characters in her life. But much more than being about vegetarianism, the book is really much more about mental illness and the treatment of mentally ill women in particular. And then a very unvegetarian title for the next one, let's go to China to read Braised Pork by Ann Yu. At the start of this book, a woman called Jia Jia goes into her bathroom to find her husband dead in the bathtub with this strange image drawn on a piece of paper next to him. And so she sets out on this mission to uncover what this image might mean. And it's a very strange book, very dreamlike. It's all about Jia Jia's connections with or detachment from various people in her life. Taking us to India is the book Q&A by Vikash Swarup, which is the book that the movie Slumdog Millionaire was based on. So just like in that movie, this book opens with our main character in the book called Ram being accused of cheating on the TV game show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And each chapter then tells a different story from Ram's life which explains how he knew the answer to that particular question. The plot itself though is very different from the movie, so it's the same format but a whole new story to uncover. Next up to Russia, and there is just so much classic Russian literature to choose from, but I'm going to recommend the book The Light in the Dark by Mikhail Shishkin. This is a story told through love letters, written between these two lovers who have been separated after the man was sent to war, but it's a very unusual structure. We don't get the traditional back and forth. These letters are being written seemingly completely removed from time. The woman is writing her letters from a different century than the man is writing his. And as the book goes on, the structure starts to make more sense. But it's this really unique experimental novel that won the most major Russian literary award. For a Lebanese book, there's Be As In Beirut by Iman Humaydan. This book is made up of four interlocking stories about four women living in the same apartment building in Beirut during the Lebanese Civil War. So we have one woman who is determined to emigrate with her two children, whether that is with or without her husband. We have one woman mourning the loss of her daughter. We have one woman who is a filmmaker who's come back to Beirut to make a film about it. And finally, we have a woman called Maha who stays in the apartment even as her family and her city fracture around her. So it is a very moving novel about war and loss. And then let's travel to Egypt, where we're going to read Vertigo by Ahmed Murad. So in this book, Ahmed is a photographer who one night in a nightclub witnesses the death of a friend in a fight between two business rivals. And the book then becomes this really tense political thriller where Ahmed has to go into hiding after getting caught up in this web of lies and cover-ups as the perpetrators of this crime will stop at nothing to hide it. Travelling down to Zambia, the book The Old Drift by Namwali Sapel is a really interesting book that spans generations and genres. So we start by jumping all the way back to 1904, where on the banks of the Zambezi River was a colonial settlement called The Old Drift. And one mistake made by one man on one day in 1904 kicks off this cycle of retribution between three different Zambian families that lasts through the generations, into present day and beyond. So this book that starts as historical fiction ends up as futuristic sci-fi, all telling the story of this one nation. And then for another book that takes us back to the early 20th century, we are going to travel to South Africa with the book Little Sons by Zakes Mda. So in this book, our main character Malangana is searching for the woman he fell in love with 20 years before. And this love story is woven into the true story of Hamilton Hope, a colonial magistrate who was trying to bring the Eastern Cape under the control of the British people before he was assassinated. So this book is a reclaiming of history as well as being a beautiful love story. And next we're travelling to Nigeria, where again there is such a wealth of beloved literature. So I've tried to pick a book that I haven't seen quite as many people talking about, and that is The Secret Lives of Babasegi's Wives by Lola Shanayan. 
This is the story of a polygamous union in present day Nigeria from all of the different perspectives of the women in this marriage and their different reasons they have for being in this marriage are all so varied and so interesting. So we really get to hear a range of very different experiences of this family. Then of course there's the patriarch Baba Segi who is laughably ignorant about a lot of things so the book is very entertaining as well as being incredibly perceptive. Then we're travelling up to Algeria for the book Women of Algiers in Their Apartment by Asia Jebar. So this is a collection of short stories that was actually denounced in Algeria for containing too much political criticism, so a very interesting book. The stories are about the plight of Algerian women who went straight from being oppressed by colonialism to being oppressed by a patriarchal post-colonial regime, even one that was celebrating liberation. And the title story literally goes in and out of the consciousness of these different women living their lives in Algiers. Okay, coming a bit closer to home now, we are heading to France, where we're going to read a delightful book called The Rest of Their Lives by Jean-Paul Didier Laurent. So this is a really heartwarming book, perfect for fans of The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. It's about a woman called Manel who works as a carer to the elderly and a man called Ambroise who has a very unusual job, he works in embalming. And these two characters are brought together by a very unlikely request from Manel's favourite client, the 82 year old chef Samuel. And so they end up going on this road trip together to Switzerland and it will just make your heart sore. And seeing as this book already kindly drove us to Switzerland, from there we haven't got far to go up to Germany, where we're going to read The Trap by Melanie Rabe. This is a thriller about a woman called Linda, whose sister was killed 12 years earlier, and the murderer was never caught, but only Linda saw his face. And now, 12 years later, she's just seen his face again. He is now a news reporter. Linda is this infamously reclusive novelist. And so she decides to set a trap. She writes a book about a woman who is murdered and whose murderer is never caught and she agrees to give just one media interview to that reporter. In Sweden I obviously had to choose some of that famous Swedish crime so here let's read The Secret Life of Mr Rose by Hakan Nesse who has been described as the godfather of Swedish crime. This book is set in a secluded hut in the middle of the woods. Great start. So Mr Rose pretty much hates his life, hates his family, so when he wins some money in the lottery he decides to buy this secluded hut and he spends his days there alone, returning each night to his wife who is completely oblivious. But then one day a young woman on the run from her abusive ex stumbles across Mr Rose's secluded hut and their lives will forever be changed. Sneak peek, a body is going to show up near the hut and Mr Rose is going to end up being the prime suspect. And finally, one more stop before we come home, let's go to the Netherlands and read The Ditch by Herman Koch, which is about the mayor of Amsterdam becoming completely obsessed with the idea that his wife is having an affair. So this is an exploration of pathological jealousy and paranoia, which as the book goes on, we learn is almost a defence mechanism to distract our main character from the other dark and difficult things going on in his life. And Herman Koch is brilliant at writing dark portrayals of human behaviour. And just like in his other very famous book, The Dinner, this book gives us an insight into the political world of the Netherlands. And with that, our grand tour is over. From the Netherlands, it's a pretty easy trip back home for me, and I think to welcome me back to England, I will pick up something by Kate Morton, who, despite being Australian herself, is very famous for her wonderful books set in English country homes. But do leave us a comment. Which countries did we miss out that you wanted to hear about? Maybe we can do this again, or even do a dedicated video on any countries you particularly wanted to hear about books from. And for more travelling vicariously with Book Break, I will link a playlist here of all of our videos that take you on adventures. See you next time.